There are uh, numerous myths about Rosie the Riveter who went to work during World War II and brandished her welding gun and so on. And her muscles. And her <laughs> muscles, right. And sometimes with a baby in a Lanham child care center. But we don't have very many records of women who were actual Rosies, that, who, that is, who went to work. And the Brooklyn Historical has some wonderful papers and documents, I gather, that deal with two or three really quite articulate women. Talk to us of first about uh, where these women might have worked uh, in Brooklyn. The, with the, the Navy Yard women yes. specifically. Well, before 1942, these women might have had other jobs elsewhere along the Brooklyn waterfront, but they likely were not working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Before, uh, essentially before Pearl Harbor, Almost no women were actually working at the Navy Yard, which was offered coveted industrial jobs that paid quite well. But after Pearl Harbor, you see a call for a speed up on the part of the shipbuilders at the Navy Yard. And then the idea of women coming on as workers begins to seem like something that was more based in reality. And by the end of the war, about 6,000 women um, worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard over the course of the war. So this confirms the notion that in jobs that had previously been all male jobs, women began to move into them. So 6,000 women out of about 70,000 total workers That's at right. the Brooklyn Navy Yard at their peak. At the height of the war, right. there were 70,000 workers working there. And can we say anything in general about who these women were? Were they young? Were they educated? Were they, did they live and work in Brooklyn? You really see a cross-section of women working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard during World War II. You see quite a lot of young women, and actually young women are disproportionately represented in our archives, in part because they lived longer, and so when it came time for us to interview them, they were the ones who were still around. But certainly you would have seen married women and single women. You would have seen women who hadn't worked before, but more likely would have seen women who had held different kinds of jobs before they began their work at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, you would have seen um, both black and white women, though black and white women tended to have different experiences at the Navy Yard, and women, African-American women dealt with a, a dual sense of discrimination um, and had thus a different experience than white women did. But back up a little bit. Are you saying that the women who went to work at this Navy Yard were all discriminated? against? Did they all feel uncomfortable, whether they were black or white? Or? Well, I think maybe let's think about what we mean by discrimination. If we're talking about pay, then certainly. Um, there you mean were the women were paid less? Women were largely paid less. So even though they were now doing jobs like welding jobs, they were paid less? There was a national call by the War Labor Board to pay women equally with men as early as 1942. But there were lots of ways that this was gotten around, changing the names of the jobs. Interestingly, um, apprentices, often women were not called apprentices, they were called helpers, mm. which I think that has remarkable gendered uh, implications to it. So it wasn't always the case, but in most cases you find women making less than men were making for the same work. And were black women making less than white women, or was there less, dis less racial discrimination? I think the problem was is that African American women were not getting the same job opportunities oh. as white women were. So it, if an African American woman found herself in the position of a ship fitter or, or welder, that was fantastic, you know, but often um, African-American women, like African-Americans writ large in the Navy Yard, going back to the 19th century, were um, actually put on uh, more menial labor. So let's take a look at one of these women. Mm -hmm. You have the records of a woman named Lucy Culkin. That's right. and 
uh, we have sitting in front of us the badge that she wore. Tell us a little bit about Lucy and when she went to work. Absolutely. So we have Lucy's badge here, and then next to it we have the badge of her husband, Alfred Colkin. So Lucy and Alfred both grew up in Bensonhurst neighborhood of Brooklyn. They both came from Jewish families. They likely knew each other before they had what Lucy described as their whirlwind courtship and marriage. And then Al um, joined the Navy and left, um, left Brooklyn, um, went to a bunch of different places, Chicago and then California. And that's the point where Lucy took her civil service exam and um, decided to join the ranks at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So she made her way up to being a ship fitter third class. To be a ship fitter was a tough job. Um, she was essentially making all of the pieces and arranging all the pieces that would eventually be used in putting together the ship. So she was a fabricator, essentially. But Lucy had a college degree. She did. She went to Hunter. And she went to Hunter, and she had worked for a couple of years That's as right. a social worker. So why did she end up in a wartime factory? You know, you get the sense from her letters that both she and her husband were actually very patriotic and they felt very passionately about what this meant to their nation. Um, even when Lucy decides that she's going to leave her job at the Navy Yard in 1944 to go be with her husband in California, whom she was madly in love with. She did it with some misgivings. It was very, very difficult for her to give up this work. And I think part of it was that she came to have a great sense of pride for the enormous labor that she was doing for her country. Mm. Now, Lucy and Al Alfred, mm -hmm. I've got his name right, I hope. <laughs> uh, Lucy and Alfred were uh, newlyweds. Yes. They married in 42. That's right. He continued to work for a while in the Navy Yard, and then he enlisted in the Navy and was sent to the West That's right. Coast. And Lucy, did she stay in the Navy Yard, or did she follow him, or? She worked for the Navy Yard for two years, from 1942 to 1944. Um, Al was moving around quite a bit, and when it became clear that he was going to be stationed for some time in California, it was at that point that she decided to go out and, and be with him. And you know, I mean, I think it's important to remember, first of all, that they were newlyweds and that they had spent most of the first two years of their marriage apart. Her letters reflect a real interest in becoming a mother, which she eventually mm. did, and I think that was very much on her mind at the time. And it gives you a sense of the kind of the competing motivations that she was facing at the time about um, this sort of the duty to be with her husband and the desire to be with her husband and the real sense of duty that she had about her job. And I think a desire to work as well, which she continued to do for the rest of her life. So she embodies the kind of tension that we sometimes attribute to the war with the men gone, if you could join them, you did. If not, you did your bit at home. I mean, but sh she did incredible work for the Navy, uh, for th at the Navy Yard, and her work was very arduous, but I actually think that there are probably a lot of women who worked in the Navy Yard who had it harder than her. And those would be, first of all, African-American women, and second of all, women who had families to support. Women were expected to work um, according to the requirements of the Navy Yard 58 hours a week. So Lucy worked 58 hours a week, six days? She worked 10 days, 10, 10 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and eight hours on Saturday. Now Lucy had no small children. That's right. But how did a woman with small children manage that? I mean, that's a great question, Alice. Um, family networks, ideally, if they had them, but there was certainly no childcare provided at the Brooklyn Navy Yard to help them. So this was an enormous sacrifice on the part of, of many women and on the part of their children, um, certainly. And one that really shows that that kind of infrastructure of support for women workers absolutely didn't exist at that time. You say African-American women suffered worse discrimination. Um, let me pause and say that when you read Lucy's letters, you realize that she and, and some of her oral interviews, you realize that she complains Absolutely. of the heat in the summer, of the freezing, freezing cold in the winter. She complains constantly about her feet, feet. her feet hurting. 
And now you're going to tell us that African American women suffered even more than that. And because you know, I think Lucy would agree. Actually, Lucy was very forward thinking at the time. Lucy um, had great sympathy for the African American co workers that she worked with. Um, she herself describes a story about a friend who finally made it up to welder class and thus was able to earn that level of income, but struggled greatly, didn't know if she wanted to actually work in that position, but felt this duty to do it because so few African American were actually African American women were actually allowed to even act as welders. Mm -hmm. And eventually she tells Alan a later letter that this woman, that this friend can chose to stay with the welding, understanding how significant it was for her to move up to that level. So it's that, it's, it, what, a sense, what a sort of a burden of responsibility that is, that you get this opportunity to do this, and even if it's not the work that you necessarily want to do, you feel that you have to do it right. for the good of your race. And, and what's amazing is that some of these women had options which were or it would have seemed to have been quite satisfying. For example, one of the African American women with whom Lucy worked was a violinist, yes. a professional yes. violinist, yes. who quit after staying in the factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard yeah. for about two years to go join a orchestra. Yes. And yet she stuck it out for two full years. That must have taken some patriotic feeling. I think we can't underestimate, first of all, the sense of collective patriotism that existed during World War II, but also when we add race into that, the role that war has played and war service has played in African Americans um, somehow proving themselves to a racist society as being worthy of equal citizenship. You see that in the Civil War as well as in World War I and World War II. So I think, again, there was sort of a dual duty there, one to your country and one to the betterment of, of, of the race. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to talk about is what happens when these, I mean, after all, relatively few women enter a workforce which consists of a vast majority of men who are paid better, have better jobs, aren't really comfortable working with women. Do they put up with them? Do th you, see mix, you see mixed reports of this. Um, so in some cases, many women described being very uncomfortable around the men. There was a sense of resentment. For example, there were no women's rooms in the Brooklyn <laughs> Navy Yard. And so some of the men's rooms had to be re-outfitted to be the women's rooms. So the idea of giving up your workspace and your spaces outside of that workspace could have could create tension. Mm -hmm. One of the places that I think Lucy describes significant tension is with the craft unions that marked most of the labor experience in the Navy Yard before the, before then. So unions at the Navy Yard were again the Boilermakers Union, the Shipfitters Union, and by and large, craft unions were all men were uninterested in women's participation. And Lucy describes being laughed at when she approached uh, the craft unions. This is also a time when you see the rise of the CIO. And so um, Lucy describes um, being, seeing much more positive reception from that very different vision of unionism. Uh, tell us a little bit about the relationship between Alfred and Lucy. Uh, I mean, they're newlywed, so I assume they're in love, but do we know this? Do we have evidence? Oh, copious evidence. <laughs> um, the Culkin papers at Brooklyn Historical Society contain the correspondence that they wrote back and forth to each other during their separation between 1942 and 1944. And you see a couple that is truly infatuated with each other. Um, you know, they are exchanging, you know, Kisses, right, um, you know, through their through their letters. Uh, actual their, kisses. In some cases, you actually have a beautiful lipstick mark um, <laughs> right on a on a on a letter that you couldn't have. It couldn't be more perfect. Um, but also, just loving words and encouragement. You know, Lucy went to college and Al didn't, and so you also see Lucy trying mm. to sort of gently teach him new vocabulary and new kind of information, describe the, the books that she's been reading to him. So. It's really um, this remarkable 
glimpse into a, a marriage just beginning. Mm, wonderful. And when the war ends, uh, what do Lucy and Al do? Do we know? Well, they settle back in New York City, and they have two children. And does Lucy continue to work? Lucy do does continue to work. She, when she goes to California, I believe she works as a waitress for a short time um, wh while Al is still stationed out there. And, and then when they, when they return to New York City, she does clerical work. Um, and then she, does, she eventually you know, achieves that dream and has two children. Wonderful. Well, I suppose she enacts ro both Rosie the Riveter and the American Dream. She just gives a, a, a concreteness to the experience of Rosie the Riveter, who is this sort of icon, but this is a woman with feelings and observations and sore feet and tells you a little bit about what that day-to-day -day must have been like on that shipbuilding floor. Thank you.